So good morning, everyone. Welcome to day five. Thank you for joining us again today. Today, we're going to be talking to Brent about fire safety, and this, that's both on campus and off campus, so in your homes. And then we are going to follow up with Jennifer, who's going to talk to us today about off-campus housing tips and tricks to make sure that you are finding uh, suitable accommodations. So Brent, if you want to take it over. So I want to thank you for inviting me to the sessions. Very important, obviously, fire safety, because it's things that you're going to need to know to keep you safe. I'm going to talk a about a couple things, um, be it the fire alarm systems we have at the college, as well as fire safety off campus. Now, I appreciate that Jennifer's going to touch a bit on that, just a little bit, in her presentation. So if there's any questions moving forward, feel free to send me an email, um, and I'm happy to answer those questions. But I think we'll be able to cover it collectively between the two of us today. So I'm going to talk about what's normal off campus versus what's not normal off campus, because sometimes there's people. Um, that could potentially take it advantage of you. Um, and because of that, I want to give you information to keep you safe. So I'm going to go ahead and do a quick screen share here, and then we'll get started with the presentation. Crystal, if you can give me a thumbs up, if you can see that. Perfect. Two thumbs up. You can really see that. That's awesome. Um, and sorry. I have some pop-ups coming up here. Just waiting for it. There we go. Let me shrink that down. So everything that we're going to be talking about is online on what we call the portal site. Um, the portal might not make sense to you at this point in time until you're actually physically at the college and you start your academics. Um, but once you do, um, you'll be using it every single day. So I'm with the emergency management office. I'm a certified fire inspector, amongst other things. Um, and the information that I'm providing you today is located on the tab called Environment, Health, Safety, and Emergency Services. So it's under Standard 12, Emergency Preparedness and Response. And more importantly, it's on the quick link. So you can click on the tab here where it says Fire and Life Safety, and you can pull up this presentation if you want to see anything. Um, one thing you need to know about fire is it evolves very, 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 very quickly. Um, it doesn't give you a lot of time, doesn't give you an opportunity to prepare. So you have to react efficiently and quickly. That doesn't mean to rush. That doesn't mean to run. It just means that you have to be convicted um, when you choose an action and be able to do it um, efficiently. So I'm going to show you a quick video. Um, I do apologize somewhat. Um, there's a Christmas tree in the video, so I'm not making a political statement or trying to offend anyone in any way, shape, or form if you choose not to celebrate. Um, or you celebrate something differently. This is just merely the video that the National Fire Protection Association has provided um, because it's an excellent video. So what you're going to see here is a simulated Christmas tree fire. We'll start from the beginning. I don't know why YouTube always starts at 10 or multiple seconds into the video, um, but it's going to be a Christmas tree fire. So what happens with a Christmas tree is it's extremely dry. So in the fire world, that's called a fuel load. Because it's a fuel load, it means it's going to burn really, really quickly. You're going to see that this one is not watered, so it's a dry Christmas tree, and they're going to simulate an electrical burn right here. So that could be a freight electrical cord, that could be an extension cord, something that's causing this electrical source to light this tree on fire. Pay attention to this clock down here in the right-hand corner, because it will actually uh, do a countdown. Let's see if I move that up in the top of the screen, and see how quickly fire can evolve this Christmas tree. So if you had a working smoke alarm in the house, you would be able to safely evacuate at this point in time. A couple of things I want you to pay attention to with regards to how fire evolves and, and how it consumes a room. Fire is like a mouse. It's going to look for any hole that it can to escape, um, and it's going to leave there. So obviously this is open, so they can actually record it, but you see how the fire is behaving. It's going out and it's going above. You'll also see that the walls aren't catching on fire, and we'll talk about that in a couple of seconds. So within 18 seconds, a fire can fully consume a room. Um, within 30 seconds, you will be talking fatalities if you don't have working smoke detectors. Just illustrating on how se severe um, and how quickly this can uh, evolve out of control. So I'm going to get back to the presentation only because I, I unfortunately have a little bit uh, limited time. 
But something to know is anytime you're off campus, if you need police, fire, ambulance, um, or help in general, the number you dial is 911. I appreciate depending on the country that you live in, sometimes there's a fee associated to calling the emergency line. Um, there is not in Canada. You can call that for free. Excuse me. So when you call 911, they're going to say police, fire, ambulance. You're going to say either police, fire, ambulance, whatever it is that you need. Um, and then tell them what your location is, your address, what's going on, how many people are affected by. It, okay. So 911 is a number off campus. So things in Canada and Ontario are built to protect you. So we have what's called the Ontario Building Code, which um, dictates how we build things based on building code of when the structure was built. So you're gonna see some buildings look different than others. So if you are on our campus at 1001 Fanshawe College Boulevard, as an example, a building is gonna look very different um, than the new building that's being built because in 1967, different provisions versus what we have today. If a building is renovated, current building code applies and all current provisions must be known as retrofit. So the building has to be brought up to that standard. So building code, is how it's built, fire code is how it's maintained, inspected, and how you use it. It's very important to know that you can be charged under the Ontario Fire Code, and you can actually receive jail time or civil lawsuit. So you have to do the right thing because you will be held accountable. So the building is designed to protect you. So this is a common house, if you will, or a common structure um, where you have working smoke detectors. So there's gonna be one on each level. So in Ontario, you have to have a working smoke detector outside your bedroom. Um, and then if you're living in a house that's multi-leveled, it has to be on the stairs where the smoke migration would go up. So in between level one versus level two or basement otherwise. So ideally you'd want the smoke detectors interconnected. So when one goes off, they all go off. We also have at our campus emergency lighting that will illuminate your path of travel. We wanna make sure that all stairs are unobstructed. When you talk about a fire condition, it's not the flame that is going to cause you harm, it's the smoke. So in that scenario where we saw the Christmas tree and the flame started, what happens is you will see a black smoke that starts coming down towards ground level. You cannot see in that smoke, absolutely not. So that's why we would say in a fire condition to stay low and crawl below the smoke because the smoke's up there, which means you have to be down there where the clean air is. All these doors are in place to protect you. So whether it's a fire rated or a door or not, keep it closed because it's going to contain the fire. So at the college, we have what's called fire rated doors, has a 45 minute rating. Any door that leads into the corridor is a fire rated door. If I stand with a blowtorch against the door, it will not be compromised for 45 minutes. It will maintain its integrity. So keeping the door closed allows the fire to be compartmentalized. And it's allowing the smoke and flame to go up. And when it goes up, that's where the detection is, as opposed to if a door is open, then it goes out. Prop and open a fire door is a fire code offense, by the way, so don't do it. So all these things are in place to protect you. So what do you do when you discover a fire? You want to remove persons from the affected area. You want to ensure all windows and doors are closed. If you are on campus or in a building that has a fire alarm uh, system, pull the pull station, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes. Then you're going to let the emergency responders know. Could be the fire department at 911 or our campus emergency line at any of our campuses is 519-452-4242. That's how you get help. Try to extinguish a fire train to do so. Obviously, it's not a reasonable expectation, so you don't have to do that. And then leave. Report to the evacuation assembly area, and you'll see that in a couple minutes on some fire exit maps. So these are called pull stations. There's different variations. So there's the pull down method, there's the lift and pull. It says fire rate on it, pull it here. So we've actually had this translate. I sent to Crystal and the team um, just to make sure that you guys are aware of what it does. So anytime you see flame, smoke, or you perceive danger, be it that there's gonna harm everyone in the building and you need to tell it, everyone, pull this pull station. That's how you get the fire department to attend the college. So when you pull it, the fire department will attend and then if you pull it, the campus security services team will attend, the floor wardens will attend. Um, if you're living off campus, the fire department will attend. If you are acting in good faith, meaning you believe there's danger, absolutely nothing wrong will happen to you because you can articulate why you pulled it. If you happen to pull the pull station and there's no fire, so say it's an exam as an example, and then you go and pull a pull station on one of the 600 cameras within the college, somebody's going to ask you why you pulled that pull station. 
if you do not have a legitimate reason, very, very, very bad things will happen to you. You can be charged under the fire code. You will get a bill for $12,000, which is the response for the fire department to come to the college. And then it will potentially affect your student visa because it's a criminal code offense. You can't do it unless you're acting in good faith, okay? So if you see fire, flame danger, pull it, but don't pull it because you think it opens a door. Don't pull it because you know it's an exam and you wanna get out of the exam. It doesn't actually stop your exam. It just delays it by five minutes. Um, but just be very mindful of that. So internal responders will attend. You'll see within the colleges that the whatever location you're at, the fire do not enter sign will illuminate. The heating, ventilation and air conditioning system shuts down because it doesn't want it to actually spread it throughout the campus. And then the mobility impaired persons will begin to evacuate and elevator doors will come down to the ground level with the doors opening up. So campus other than 1001 Fanshawe College Boulevard, so LDA, South Campus, Woodstock, Oxford, St. Thomas, Simcoe Campus, if you hear the bells, and it will only be bells, that's called a single stage, evacuate to the evacuation assembly area or a safe spot outside of the building and then remain there until you're told it's safe to go back in by emergency responders, not your friends. They don't have that training to say it's safe. So at 1001 Fanshawe College Boulevard, we have what's called a two-stage system that also is at LDB downtown at one of the downtown campuses. And it starts with an alert stage. So this is what it's going to sound like. And I apologize because it's going to start with ladies and gentlemen. We do have a new updated version that's more inclusive. I just don't have that sound clip because they haven't sent it to me yet. And then that will just continue to repeat itself. So what happens? Grab personal belongings that are within arm's reach. So your jacket, your purse, your cell phone, your laptop, anything that you don't want stolen, reach down, put on your jacket, get ready to go outside. Um, you're going to hear that Canada is quite cold. For some reason right now, it's a little bit warmer than what we're used to, um, but it does get really cold and we want to make sure that you're not outside freezing. Um, I was talking to one of the Filipino guys over here at the bus stop and he said, how cold does Canada get? I said, well, it's simple. If you have a freezer, open it up and sit in it for 30 minutes and you'll understand. Um, we want to make sure that you're not going to your locker or anywhere else to, re, re, uh, to obtain personal property. Um, and the reason being is you saw how quickly that fire evolves. So every second that you're delaying responding um, means that you're not safely evacuating. So a fire within the college, it can take two to three minutes to consume a room, three to five minutes to consume a whole corridor. So first stage, stand by, wait for additional instructions, follow the emergency responders, instructions, mobility impaired persons begin to evacuate. If you have a mobility impairment um, issue or challenge, connect with Counseling Accessibility Services. Obviously disclose that there's a reason you can't safely evacuate, such as a wheelchair or crutches, or something that is going to um, decrease your response time. And then they'll send a work order. And then I will get together with you and we'll do what's called a personal emergency plan. So I'll talk to you about what you need to know to keep you safe um, based on, on uh, what's going on there. So a fire system can go to second stage. When it goes to second stage evacuation, it sounds like this. So that will repeat itself. So the way that that gets activated is we can do it, um, be it the pull station, our control center can do it on the fire alarm panel, any turning of valves or cabinets. Um, fire evacuation means get out, go to the evacuation assembly area outside the building. So what do you do when you evacuate? Never use an elevator, okay? If an elevator is operational for some reason, because remember when I said, if the building's built a little bit long ago, the elevator may not come down and default to the ground level. It might still operate. Do not use the elevator because what will happen is when that cab goes up and down the shaft of the elevator, it actually will act like a piston in a car or a chimney in a house and can actually draw that smoke into the cab with you, which makes it very, very dangerous. So ideally, if you're on ground level, get out of the building, go to the evacuation assembly area. Mobility impaired can go into a different building beyond the separation doors, but that's something we'll talk about during your PEP. 
Um, if you if it's safe to the stairwell, report location if you're unable to evacuate or classroom, close the door. Um, at no point in time are removing anyone from a wheelchair or helping people down the stairs if they're in a wheelchair. Um, very, very dangerous and we don't do that. All the emergency procedures are posted in all the classrooms as well as all the common areas. They'll look like this, so it tells you what the emergency number is. Um, you can also use a call box, which is a two-way phone on the wall. Press the button and then you can talk. And it tells you where you are and it tells you where your nearest exit points are and everything that you need to know to keep yourself safe. Once you go outside, you're looking for this sign. So even if you're off campus, some apartment buildings will have this or office areas. It's called an evacuation assembly or some people call it a muster point as well. It's just a gathering spot. So for us, it's the parking lots at the college. It's identified on the map. And obviously there's multiple ones at 1001 because we have 17 buildings. So there's going to be different locations based on the building location. So things you need to know. Fire code violations. So storage practices, handling practices are things that you have to be mindful of because that's what could potentially cause a fire. So you have to be uh, mindful of things that has a live flame, causes sparks, hot objects, chemicals that are potential for ignition um, or can aggravate a fire if it's already uh, evolving. So fire hazard also includes all types of potential threats to prevention practices. So built-in fire alarm systems. So how do we deal with this? Well, we classify it as low, moderate, or high risk. So what do we do? We eliminate the hazard. So with COVID as an example happening, we couldn't have people face-to-face -face in the college. So the elimination of the risk is do online classes, which is an ideal. I teach online too, and I wasn't a big fan of it, but you have to do what you have to do. Um, or frequent inspection hot work permits. So if something happens and you're doing something different than the norm, let our office know. And we will make the accommodations, make sure that it is doing or you're doing it safely. And then, of course, through approved processes. So when you're living off campus, you want to ensure that your residence is not overcrowded. In Canada, it is not normal to sleep in a laundry room beside a gas furnace. I do know that there are landlords that will take advantage of you because the more people they can cram into the house, the better for them, the worst for you. Ideally, you want to see one person per bedroom. Some bed times bedrooms has two or three. That's okay, as long as the bedroom is big enough. But we want to make sure that you're not jam-packed into a space. You also want to make sure that the smoke alarm is working and it's outside your bedroom or on the stairwell between floors. Make sure that you're in an approved bedroom. So sleeping in a garage, as an example, is not normal. Um, and you want to ensure that you have a, a means to escape. So how can you safely leave if there's a fire? So make sure there's a stairwell, make sure there's a, wait, a window in the basement that you can fit through if you have to go through the window. And then any questions that you have can be either um, directed to London Fire Department or Jennifer, the housing mediator, or of course myself, if you have any questions. So there's things that we have to be mindful of. These are things that are in place to protect us and we wanna make sure that we're not impairing those. So all storage must be minimum 18 inches away from the deflector shield. So this is the deflector shield. So storing a box up this close to the sprinkler head, as an example, um, is not a good idea. Don't hang anything on a sprinkler head. So Christmas decorations, do not hang it up there. It's signage. Uh, when I used to work in a old age home, for lack of better terms, they used to hang up clothing sometimes on that. And I can't imagine doing that. So we're not obstructing that in any way, shape or form. So sprinkler head, a lot of water under pressure. When this bulb gets to the point of boiling, so 135 degrees on this one, it will burst causing the water to come out. When it comes out, it's gonna slap off of this deflector shield and then it causes like a water curtain. And that's how it keeps you safe. Wanna make sure that all your access to exits, so this is the way out, are kept clear. So don't put any obstacles in your way because remember when I said smoke happens and you can't see, you want to make sure that you can safely crawl and leave the door without having anything in your way, especially anything that could potentially burn like boxes. You want to make sure that you're cleaning stuff. Um, even dust catches on fire, believe it or not. So if your mother or father told you growing up to clean your room, um, they're right. And you want to make sure that you're doing proper storage practices. So anything that's flammable, and you'll see on the side of the liquid where it says flammable or combustible, you're making sure you're storing that in a proper location, not junky on a shelf like this. And you want to make sure that your quantities are not large like this. So if there is a fire in here, all those things will catch on fire and they will interact with each other and make things way, way worse. You want to make sure that electrical panels are clear and that you're not storing anything in front of the electrical panels. 
the reason being is if there's a condition relating to electrical load, the fire department needs access to these panels to be able to shut the power supply off. We want to make sure that all doors are free of obstructions. So if it says exit on it, fire exit, make sure it's not blocked. These are all obstacles in your way whenever the fire actually occurs. The thing with fire is the lights usually go out. Power will be lost in a fire, which is why we have emergency lighting. You'll see it up here above this door. Uh, Want to make sure that that is unobstructed and the path of light is actually down towards the floor so it illuminates your way to get out and to exit. We have different variations of exit signs. So it has to be illuminated at all time if it has a bulb. So if this one or this one, always illuminated. And then we have what's called photoluminescent, which is a nice way to say glow in the dark. Um, so you'll see this variation of exit signs as well. Doesn't obviously have a bulb, but it has to have a light source to be able to charge that sign. We never prop or wedge it open to the door. Um, as I shared with you when we talked about the Christmas tree, um, and the reason being is heat expands. So as the fire starts burning, it can potentially push that door. And when that mouse goes out this hole, all the smoke and flame goes out. It's not allowing any of the detection up here to actually activate. Um, even if a door is not wedged open, you'll see in this scenario here where there's a wood wedge at the door, it can actually bend the door frame, which is allowing the smoke to migrate through there. So you've created an issue even though the door isn't propped open. Different variations of propped open. You will see sometimes it's down the spine of the door like here where they'll put a wood wedge in it to make sure. Um, you'll see it wedged at the bottom. This one is a twofer for fire code violation because they actually took an extinguisher off of the wall and they propped the door open with it. So it's a trip hazard as well. But sometimes it's accidental as well where somebody's walking out and then they try to brush their, their boots off or something as they're leaving and they kick it on the mat, which causes it to go under the door. So we just want to make sure that these doors open and close freely and that nothing prevents it from doing so. The fire rated on the uh, doors, you don't really need to know about, but any door that leads into a corridor or in between buildings has a fire rating. Um, if you're curious, once you get to your apartment, you'll see this on the door and it'll have a tag that says three quarter on an hour and a half frame. Want to ensure that those doors are closed. Um, you see how this has actually contained the smoke and it's allowed the fire to work on the inside as opposed to going on the outside. And this really illustrates the point on the value of keeping a door closed. This actually was a real photograph taken from one of our community partners, not at the college, but down the road from us, where it was a fire condition where the left-hand side, the door was kept open, and the right-hand side, the door was closed during the working fire. And you can see here that this person still has all their personal belongings, including property and pictures of their family. And unfortunately, this person has lost everything. So we want to make sure those doors are in the closed position. Those pull stations that we talked about, they're located at all the exits. So as you leave the building, you'll see the pull station. Make sure that it does not have anything blocking it. Um, sometimes it's red in color and some people don't like the red color, but we want to make sure that it is clearly visible and you can use it when you need to use it. Excuse me, safety tips for fuel handling and storage. So be aware of what you have in your apartments or otherwise. So even stuff like glass cleaner has um, alcohol in it that burns. Waterless hand sanitizer has alcohol that burns um, and you'll see warning labels on the side of it. You want to make sure that you're properly storing stuff and putting it away and making sure that's not in front of ignition source. So you want to make sure as an example that you're not putting any paint or anything that's flammable inside of a heater or in front of a heater. You want to ensure that your smoke detector or heat detectors are working and operational. So sometimes a battery operated one here, it could be potentially taken out. Or if there's an electrical one here, as an example, sometimes it's not in, in place. So make sure you have those in place. Um, I do get asked sometimes, well, what about a smoke detector in the kitchen? Because not everyone is a good cook. So sometimes they'll say the detector goes off in the kitchen. And what do I do? I said, well, there's no code requirement to leave it in the kitchen. So make sure it's not in the kitchen. Just make sure you have one outside your bedroom. One also make sure you're not overcharging things. We're not daisy chaining things into power bars. We're not Jay-Z chain into electrical. Um, and the reason being is all of these things have a resistance rating. So when you're doing this, you're overloading the circuit. Anything that draws a heat source, so a kettle, a microwave, a toaster oven, anything that heats up, photocopier has to be plugged directly into the wall, not into a power bar or not into an extension cord because there's a risk of fire. If you have something that's broken, like an extension cord, avoid taping it because what's happened here is you've compromised the sheath of it. 
So the fire coating that is there is not going to function, which creates a fire risk. Want to make sure you're not running anything through any door jams or any window sills uh, because it becomes pinch points like this. And then there's a fire risk and of course, overloading of circuits. So what happens when it overheats is it does this and it'll actually catch fire on the end. So you want to make sure you're safe. You also have to think that sometimes a good deal is a good deal, but it's a good deal because it is a good deal, meaning it's not high-end electronics or high-end components. So our friends down the road at Dollarama, which you can buy cheap stuff, I love Dollarama by the way, sells these things. They're electrical chargers for your cell phone. So you plug your USB into that end and then you can plug it into the wall to charge your cell phone. If you are paying $3 for this, you can imagine that all the parts and components are not high-end and high quality. So what happens is they use the cheapest stuff they can to be able to sell this for $3. Because of that, it melted in the plug and we caught it just before it caught fire. You can see here, it's got some black scolding here, um, but this would have potentially caught fire. So cheap isn't always better. Uh, they also at one point in time sold toy fire extinguishers. Um, people thought these were fire extinguishers. So if it's $2, know that it's probably not the highest quality. Something like this, as a matter of fact, not only does catch fire, it actually will affect your iPhone or your Android device as well. And it can mess up the electronics in it. So just be very careful on what you buy. So lastly, if there's any questions, that is my email address. That is my contact information. I know I shared a lot um, in a very short period of time. And I appreciate uh, the team letting me go first because I do have a meeting that I do have to get to relatively soon. Um, but I will hang out for two minutes and 21 seconds. If anyone has a quick question, just go ahead and turn on your microphone. If not, then I will depart and then Jennifer can, uh, whatever Crystal's doing, I don't know. Um, then Jennifer can provide There's her presentation. There's a fruit fly and he keeps coming by me. Like oh, that's awesome. It looked like you're being attacked by a helicopter. <laughs> Are there any questions? I know I said a lot in a short period of time. Brent, am I able to get a copy of your presentation so I can load it into the chat tomorrow? Yeah, by all means, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I'll probably get to you on Monday, to be honest with you, just because I have a heavy meeting day today. That's okay. Um, but I'll get it out to you for sure. Perfect, thank you. Um, I want to congratulate you guys actually on joining the best college in Canada. Um, I absolutely love Fanshawe College, and I love everything it represents because everything that we do is for the student, which is quite important to me. Um, and I just want to congratulate you. So I hope I see you in the hallways. If I do, please come up, say hi. Um, hopefully it's in, in good terms and not because something significant has happened. Um, I always tell people that if I do my job well, you really don't see me that often. Um, but I, uh, I look forward to meeting all of you. And then uh, I'll be seeing Crystal on December 14th. Thanks for the informative presentation, Brent. A great Thank segue you. into mine. So also Perfect. just for my own learning and reminders. Appreciate it. Awesome. You guys have a great day. Take care. Good. Yeah. Um, so Crystal, I think can I just jump in or do we need to Yeah, you should be able to just jump right in. Perfect. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so my name is Jennifer. I work for Western University as well as Fanshawe College. We have a bit of a joint program regarding off-campus housing. So we do service both schools. Um, my home base is at the university, uh, but my supervisor is at Fanshawe once a week, and you can contact us five days a week at either school. Um, I'm just going to pull up my PowerPoint here and share my screen. So Crystal probably will need a confirmation as well. Um, I think I made you co-host. I should show my screen, but my screen, the PowerPoint's not coming up. Yeah, it says, like, yeah, so it, it, it did make you co-host. Yeah, no, sorry, I'm just, for some reason, not showing me my screen with my PowerPoint on it. Um, Okay, can we see the PowerPoint? Does that come up for everyone? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, perfect. Sometimes a little funny. Okay, um, so again, I'm just gonna dive into uh, stuff about off-campus housing and we're gonna talk about the search. Um, and uh, if you have any questions at any time, please feel free everyone to chime in. Um, I will be checking the chat and Crystal, if we can also maybe just help monitor that, feel free to chime in during my presentation. Otherwise at the end, we'll also have um, some time for questions. So we'll jump right in. 
right? So uh, things to consider before your search. Um, we're going to break it into five things of uh, cost, housemates, accommodation, lease, and lifestyle. So I'm going to start with the first section, which is cost. Um, usually the most important thing for folks is to know what is the cost to live in London. Um, we want you to come here with a realistic expectation of what rents are like here and what we're seeing in the city. So this is just based on what we're currently seeing right now um, in this period of time. But generally, you can consider uh, the cost to be about $700 to $1,000 per bedroom in a shared accommodation. Uh, so here in London, um, you'll find student rentals, generally they range from like a one bedroom apartment to um, something you'll occupy by yourself, upwards to even eight bedrooms I have seen in one house. Um, again, here it is the norm for uh, each student to occupy their own bedroom, and then you would share the kitchen um, and number of bathrooms in the house. So that $700 to $1,000 is per bedroom price in a shared home. If you're looking to live by yourself, um, you can... Uh, you'll have to expect to pay $1,000-$300 upwards to $1,900 or even $2,000 these days for a one-bedroom apartment. Um, again, that means you have your own private one-bedroom, um, like personal bedroom for yourself, as well as your own washroom and your own kitchen and living space um, is what that would usually encompass. So we do have a rental average page here on our website here at Western. However, it hasn't been updated recently. Um, you might find in London, the rental pricing can vary a bit as student rentals tend to be a little bit on the higher end as they're closer to the campus and um, just because of the demographic that they know students will you know, pay a bit more compared to the rest of the city. So it does fluctuate a bit. Um, so again, we have some average pricing, but it's a bit outdated. Feel free to check in with us or as you search for housing, I guess you'll be able to see um, what the costs generally are like. Uh, just some extra things to consider. In addition to your rent, sometimes utilities are not included. So please be mindful of that when you are looking at the price. Um, utilities is a whole spiel on its own. <laughs> so if you have questions about it, um, we can always talk one on one. But generally, if you are paying for all the utilities in the home, in addition to the price of your bedroom, you can expect in a house to generally pay around 50 50 to $100 extra per person for utilities. Um, depending on your living situation, sometimes some utilities are included and you know the price might be lower. Um, but again, you might be looking at an extra $100 a month on top of your base rent. Um, so you have to factor that in. Internet is another thing you can share if you have roommates. Uh, generally, internet plans here run $50 to $100 per household. So that would be split among the number of roommates you have. Um, you know, think about your phone costs. Most people here at Canadian Phone Plans do run generally 40 to $100 as well per person. So think about that. Um, and at the end, yeah, what are you sharing, you know, general costs and what you might be sharing with your roommate if you have any. Uh, so big questions we get is how you can reduce your rent. So, um, you know, these aren't definitive, but uh, some suggestions we have that might help you uh, become a bit more flexible with your pricing would be living with roommates, of course. Having usually living with more people does mean your rent um, typically gets a little lower. Uh, living farther from campus. Um, so depending on your campus and where you're situated, of course, if you're looking at a house right beside your campus, it's generally going to be more expensive. So um, think about, you know, spreading it around the city. Um, Full-time students do get a bus pass included. So it does help you become a bit more flexible um, to in spreading your search around the city. Uh, typically, in, if you live in a house, usually the rooms aren't the same size, so often students um, will pay for smaller size rooms or lower level basement rooms, so if you're open to that, or if you can work that with your roommates, that might be a way to lower your rent. Um, and being flexible with your amenity preferences, uh, again, just having realistic expectations about what you can afford and um, the luxuries you might have to forego. So some students will ask us, you know, for a private bathroom um, and they want the room furnished. Um, they might want air conditioning. And again, these are luxuries for student rentals. So you will be paying premium pricing for that. Um, so you know, the more basic you go, the better. Um, of course, all homes do come with the basic necessities like bathrooms and kitchens. It's just the extras, even like laundry can be an extra feature sometimes in a home. Um, and then just the last two points, you can always try negotiating your rent with your landlord. It never hurts to ask. Sometimes you can um, negotiate rent a little lower if you're willing to maybe like, do work, for example, um, like lawn care, store removal for your landlord, or if you have like a garage or storage room, landlord might want for themselves. Sometimes they're willing to lower the rent a bit for you. It doesn't hurt to ask. 
Um, just an extra cost to consider uh, the rental deposit. So here it is very common that landlords will ask for a first and last month's rent for a lease. Um, for international students, this gets a little trickier because by law, the landlord can ask for a deposit as well as a guarantor. Uh, so as students, knowing that you don't have full-time jobs, most landlords here will ask for a Canadian guarantor, and that would usually mean your parent or guardian or someone that's willing to co-sign your lease with you, so that way if you stop paying rent, they default onto your guarantor. And for international students, it gets a little trickier because by law, a landlord can ask for a guarantor or they can deny signing a lease with you, and they can require a Canadian guarantor. So if you don't have anyone you know in Canada that's able to sign for you and that your landlord would approve of, um, please be prepared. Uh, landlords might ask for a different form of reassurance um, for your financial security. So that often means paying a bigger deposit. Um, I have some landlords even ask for the whole uh, one year's worth of rent up front. Um, of course, that's not financially viable for a lot of people. You can always try to negotiate that if they say, I want a bigger deposit. Um, Maybe you can lower the amount, whether it's just a couple of months ahead of time or such. Um, but also, you know, some landlords don't require that at all, and they're happy to take an international student without a Canadian guarantor or a deposit. So um, shop around if you're limited to that. But please don't be surprised if a landlord does ask you for a lot more money up front because you are an international student, unfortunately. Um, Tenant insurance might be an extra cost and something we would suggest you get when you're renting here. And just think about your general lifestyle. Um, we highly encourage students to start planning budgets before they commit to anything with their lease because, you know, consider grocery costs. Um, you know, maybe researching a bit of what grocery costs are like in Canada right now. I think average bills for students are looking at three to four hundred dollars, I think, is, is what we're hearing. Um, you know, entertainment, if you're... Um, you know, your lifestyle in general, just please keep that in mind, along with, of course, your, your school obligations, like tuition, your textbooks and all that. So um, please, please, <laughs> we really encourage everyone to budget their costs. Um, and then maybe, you know, you might have to um, fluctuate a bit about housing, depending on what your other essentials are looking like. Okay, the next section, we're going to move on to housemates. So first question you want to ask yourself is how many housemates um, do you even want? Like roommates is another word I guess we say here. So um, just, you know, think about that. Are you okay? So if you want to lower your rent and live with six other people, um, is that something you're able to do <laughs> and remain um, sane about? Because some people aren't okay with living with that many people. So you have to consider that as well, like what your priorities are. And, you know, of course, are your lifestyles compatible? Um, are you on your own lease or are you in a group lease? Um, and then do you trust your other roommates to pay rent and bills on time? Often um, students here will sign one lease together with people. So if you sign a lease with me and I stop paying rent, you could be on the hook here um, for paying my portion if I stop paying rent. So um, we'll chat about leases shortly as well, but just um, when you're picking roommates, please be very selective and careful um, about picking who you live with as well, especially if you're signing a lease with them. We highly suggest you create a roommate agreement even before you actually enter a lease with anyone. So if you're considering living with anyone um, or multiple people, we do have a roommate agreement online on um, our page here at Fanshawe's Off-Campus Housing you can access. Um, these are questions to definitely ask your prospective roommates um, because beyond financial obligations, again, like with lifestyle compatibility, we get roommate conflict that lands on our desk um, ranging from you know, things like guests, to chores, to noise, general lifestyle things. So uh, to mitigate the amount of stress you might experience living with other folks in um, off campus, um, it's great to just ask some preliminary questions before you even commit to living with anyone. Uh, accommodations next. So um, if you're searching for rentals, um, we suggest you start your search at Places for Students, Fanshawe College. It is a website. So if you just Google search Places for Students, um, again, Fanshawe College, this will be the best place to look to start. Um, I don't know if anyone here is uh, in a campus that's not in London. So if you're in Woodstock, St. Thomas, um, I do apologize, but this site is mostly focused on like London rentals, so whether you're in the um, like main campus, downtown or south, um, this is the best site to go. Um, please chat with us later if you're having difficulty. If you're in a different campus, then you're you're having trouble finding off-campus housing, um, reach out to us. But um, we are mostly aware of the ones in London. So you can start your search there. 
Uh, we do have a website here at Western. I also suggest you might check out as uh, some, a lot of financial students actually live um, around Western as well. There is convenient bus routes and just a bit more um, selection around Western for student housing. So financial students often look over here at Western and our website as well. Um, and then we are aware of Facebook and Kijiji are two other platforms students do find housing on. So, I mean, you can take a look there, but um, just really be careful. There are tons of scams on those two websites. So we'll talk a bit about preventing scams as well. Um, but please, you know, I think start your search at Places for Students and Western. We still can't make guarantees, but they're both safer spaces than other websites around. Uh, so I guess this kind of moves on to the scam stuff, but we always suggest you be rental in person or by someone you trust as international students. Of course, that's not very possible all the time. Um, so at the very least, we suggest you do a live virtual tour. So please do not accept a video link on YouTube. That could easily be a scam if it's pre-recorded, if it doesn't even belong to that person. Um, by asking for a live virtual tour, you would ask the landlord to you know set up a time arrange it over Zoom, um, Skype, whatever, FaceTime, whatever platform works for both of you. Um, and then you'd ask them to start outside their property to confirm their address that they're at. So you could also do a Google search beforehand just to do a street view of the rental you're interested in so you know what it looks like on the outside. And then you can compare it to the landlord um, and what they're showing you. They should show you the unit number or the address number of their property and then watch them go inside their property so you know, again, they own it or they have access to it at least. And um, you know, they gave you a live tour so you can see it like firsthand live um, with their video out, um, what it looks like. Um, ideally, if you know someone here in London, even better. Um, and just, again, just getting some eyes on the ground to see it is the best way. Um, a lot of scams will deny uh, a tour with you. So if someone's not willing to show you the home, even virtually, like a live tour, I would be very careful because that's very likely to be a scam. Um, most scams will ask you for money up front. Um, so please don't do that. Um, always arrange to at least see the tour or see the rental in some capacity first um, and then trust your gut because sometimes it still could be a little fishy but I think generally if a landlord is willing to show you their home um, less likely it's a scam. Um, most students who get scammed just send money right off the bat so please 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 don't do that. Um, you can't get that money back or it's very difficult to. Um, if you're able to see the tour or if you're doing something virtual um, you can always ask to speak with the current tenants just to find out a bit about the rental experience with their landlord and we encourage that or if you're paying utilities for example in this rental you might want to talk to current tenants to find out some things about utilities is the home poorly insulated and you know the heating is actually really expensive or um, maybe the soundproofing isn't great in the house there are some things if you have any concerns you know it's best to speak with the people who actually live there at the moment because your landlord really won't have much of an idea since they don't live there and then we have an accommodation checklist on our website, again, found on the Fanch off-campus page. So um, that's a great chart and resource to use if you're looking for housing as it has a set of questions and things to ask your landlord. Um, and then it has uh, five um, sections on there so you can compare different rentals that you see. We do suggest you view at least three rentals or research and look into th at least three so you can compare the different options and decide if you know the pricing seems fair for the one you might be even interested in. I just a couple questions to ask yourself. Um, you might want to, you know, find out what area do you want to live in? Um, or do you want to live farther from campus? Or, you know, most people live prefer to live closer to campus, but again, it might be more expensive. So just consider that. Um, transportation options. I mentioned um, bus pass will be included for full-time students. Um, so a lot of students um, will ask us, you know, what they you have no idea where a rental is obviously in London. Um, so if you signed it, find an address or property you were interested in, uh, we suggest using Google Maps. Um, it's a very handy tool. You can plug in the campus, Fanshawe campus, whichever one you're at as your destination, and then use the, uh, put the rental address in and Google Maps will show you the different routes to get there um, through driving, through public transportation, as well as like walking. Um, the public transportation one's a great feature. It shows you the bus route. Ideally, you probably want to be one bus right away. Sometimes transferring can be a bit of a headache, especially in the cold. Um, so even if it's like a 40 minute bus ride, if it's one bus ride, it makes your life pretty easy um, just being on one route. Um, again, Google Maps is a great tool to show you and break that down for you. Uh, just some of the things, you know, what kind of rental property do you want to live in? Some students have concerns they don't love the idea of living in a house. Um, they prefer the security of like a high rise apartment building. So that's more of your style as well. Um, you have to consider that for your search. 
um, you know, considering what amenities are important to you. Do you want a backyard? Do you want a balcony? Do you want laundry, um, air conditioning? And then uh, safety of an area or the rental. Um, generally, student neighborhoods, uh, especially again close to campus, whether you're at Western or Fanshawe, generally they are high targets for theft. Um, thieves know students leave their rentals at certain periods of the time, especially summertime here. So um, don't be too deterred by that. Just practicing general safety is really great. But if you're looking around the city and want to just know a bit more, um, there is a community crime map on the London Police website. So anytime, you know, things like theft or car break-in, if someone reports it, it is plotted on this map. So you can see across the city where there might be higher clusters of activity in a certain area. Um, but again, a general safety practices um, should be enough for you, no matter where in the city you live. Uh, so rental licensing here in London. So the city of London does have their own set of rules when it comes to rentals. Um, and one of them is that landlords, most landlords do need a rental license to um, for their rental if they plan to operate it. Um, truthfully, a lot of landlords don't know this or they just don't get the licensing through the city and they still rent their places out. Um, you know, fortunately, our hands are a bit tied here. So we are, you know, we do the best we can to just the best we could do right now is inform you folks who are looking for housing that Rentals should have a rental license, but most of them don't. So law students do rent in unlicensed rentals. Um, but what it does mean if a rental is licensed um, is that it's gone through an inspection by the city as well as the fire department. So, you know, after rent's presentation with fire safety, that's a huge concern to you. Um, having a property licensed means this home is has been inspected. Um, it's up to fire code and all that. Um, just because it doesn't have a license doesn't mean it's not unsafe, but if you want that peace of mind and security, I mean, the ideal is your property is licensed and you can find it on um, the city of London has a link here. It's a public database. You can look up every address in the city. Um, if it's as a rental, if it doesn't come up, your property is not licensed. Um, if you have any concerns about that, again, please check in with us, but we just want you to all be educated about rental licensing here. Okay, and then uh, the lease. So this is a big one too. Um, so I should start to say uh, leases are legally binding documents here. Um, so please uh, just be very mindful of that before you enter any tenancy, which is why we'll just review a couple of quick points here. Um, don't sign anything unless you definitely uh, plan to fulfill your tenancy agreements because it is a legally binding document. Um, so first question you might want to ask yourselves is what kind of lease length do you need? I understand certain programs don't run um, consecutively. You might have a break, you might have a co-op, um, you might take a semester off. I don't know if you have any um, plans to not stay or to study for eight or 12 months straight, um, definitely think about that as most leases here are 12 months, which is common. You can negotiate an eight month. If you need shorter, you know, you can always negotiate with the landlord, but don't sign for a 12 month if you are only gonna be here for four months. So does the Residential Tenancy Act apply or not? Um, so here in Ontario, we do have Ontario rental law. And to qualify or for your tenancy to be eligible for, uh, to be protected by the law, Ontario rental law, um, you are protected if you were not sharing a kitchen or bathroom with a landlord or someone of the landlord's family. So most rentals in Ontario are covered by Ontario rental law, um, which is also the Residential Tenancies Act. That's the actual law. Um, but certain circumstances that students are not covered by um, the RTA would be uh, students who share a home with the landlord and share a kitchen or bathroom. So it is common. I see that enough, especially around Fanshawe. Some homeowners uh, might just be looking for some company or extra money. So they will rent out rooms in their home. And if you are sharing a kitchen or bathroom with that landlord, you are not covered by Ontario rental law. The other case would be you live with some other students and one of your roommate's parents own the home and they're the landlord. Again, um, if you're sharing a kitchen or bathroom with their daughter or son as your roommate, then you're not covered by Ontario rental law. So just uh, be mindful of that as well. Some things to keep in mind is if you're covered by Ontario rental law, certain rights and there are certain rights and responsibilities as a tenant. Um, you do have just have more protection under the law for renting, the big one being eviction. Um, sorry, question got thrown in. What will the issue, who will issue? Okay, sure, I'll touch on that in a second. Um, thank you for the question. Um, but, uh, sorry, as I was saying, if you're covered by Ontario rental law, again, you just have some more protections. It doesn't mean living with a landlord is, um, you know, the worst thing either. Just be very careful because when you're living in their home, they can evict you at any time. Again, I just wanna educate you on that. 
doesn't, you know, some landlords are great um, and you're still, you know, they will respect you as a student and a tenant, um, but just know there's that big difference there. And so there's a question here in the chat, who issues the official um, agreement? So uh, when you are protected by Ontario rental law, um, any lease, any lease you sign is still legally um, binding, but when you're covered by the RTA, the lease you sign, if you have a dispute with your landlord, um, it will be actually covered by the Landlord and Tenant Board, which is an Ontario tribunal, so it's like part of the government. Whereas if you have a dispute with a landlord and you're not covered by rental law, um, then you have to take them to small claims court, which is like suing. It's a civil matter. So it operates under two court systems. And again, because you just have more rights to you as a tenant under Ontario rental law, it's just automatic. Um, if you're not sharing a kitchen or bathroom with the landlord or the family, then the law, rental law automatically applies to you. Hopefully that answers your question. It's not like you have to apply to it or anything. It's just a default if you've um, entered tenancy with that situation. And as I touched on before, is your lease separate or joint? Um, if you don't know your roommates and you're renting a home, ideally you want to sign a separate lease so you're not responsible for anyone else and it's just you in your bedroom. But if you do sign a joint lease with people, and please be mindful, you could be responsible for their portion of their rent or their damages. Um, just more, more responsibility when you sign a joint lease. Okay. Um, we touched on the guarantor earlier, which is very common for landlords to ask here. Uh, rental applications, also pretty common, especially if you plan to apply for apartment buildings. A lot of apartment companies will issue you a rental application. Um, the big takeaway from here is do not sign multiple applications and submit them at once. Here, if you sign a rental application and you are approved, which you likely will be, um, you're responsible for the tenancy and you're kind of entering the lease almost automatically. So if you applied for five apartments one day and they all approve you, you could be held responsible for five different leases. So please be careful not to do that. Build them at one at a time. Um, you know, obviously pick your first choice, apply to it. If you get denied, then move on to the next one. Um, but just want to be clear on that. Um, sorry, here, follow-up question about the RTA quickly. Um, no, you don't have to register with the RTA. Um, the RTA is just the law here in Ontario. So you can find it online and refer to it if you want to know about your tenant rights and responsibilities. Um, but no, um, the Landlord and Tenant Board, uh, which oversees the disputes, um, that's a whole thing which you would have to file with. But the RTA is just like your automatic, like the rights and the laws you have if you're not sharing a kitchen or bathroom with a landlord or their family. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, one minute quickly. I know we're running a short on time here. Um, lease review service. We do also have a lease review service here for all students, Fanshawe and Western. You can make an appointment with us online, Zoom, phone, in person, offer it <laughs> through different ways. Highly suggest you bring your lease to us so we can walk you through some extra things. If you have some questions about your lease and your tenancy, we'll go through that with you. Um, uh, just some stuff about lifestyle. We do have some city bylaws to be mindful of. The big one that impacts students would be garbage and noise. 24-7 um, noise bylaw here in London. And we have some garbage rules in London. So your landlord should walk you through that too before you enter a tenancy. But um, in the lease review, we also mentioned these, so this is why it's, you know, we really suggest you, you meet with us just so we can uh, walk you through what it's like to rent in London, Ontario. Um, these are all things, yeah, we'll chat about in um, the lease review service, but like lawn care, lawn care, pretty sta um, standard here. Landlords will take care of your lawn, but keep in mind, most students have to remove their own snow, so you probably have to purchase a shovel when you live here, or your landlord might give you one, depends on your lease agreement. Um, fire safety, we had a whole presentation, but the big one here is just um, smoke detectors are mandatory um, and the landlord would, especially if you're licensed, they would have that smoke detector um, already installed for you. It's their responsibility to maintain that as well as install it. Um, but you know, for us, we tell students, just make sure if you see a home or move into somewhere, just make sure there are smoke detectors outside your bedroom, one on each, at least one on each floor. Um, uh, these are things here. I mean, I think we'll try the presentation, but just for the sake of time, these are things to think about when you actually move in. So um, maybe more applicable later on. But um, if you do at least review with us, we'll chat and um, I'll skip through that for now. Um, as I mentioned, we have some city property standards. So there is Ontario rental law if that applies to you or not. But even if the law doesn't apply to you as a tenant, you do have basic um, property standard requirements that need to be met by the city. So if you don't, if you're not covered by the law and you're living with the landlord and they withhold electricity or water or heat from you, 
those are vital services and the City of London will get involved. So if you have any concerns like here in the City of London, there are basic guarantees to you in, in a rental, which water, electricity, heat, um, a working toilet, a shower, as well as like a cooking um, cooking appliances to like refrigerate your food as well as like cook your food on like a stovetop. Um, so those are guaranteed to you no matter like where you live or as it should be. So if you have concerns about that, connect with us, um, as well as pest removal is a landlord's responsibility. Okay, <laughs> last two slides, just our contact details here. Um, so we've got um, Fanshawe, so this is the main contact you should reach out to. My supervisor, Melissa, is here in person once a week in room um, D1012 on Wednesdays. Um, you can reach her by email or phone at those two details, um, but also share our contact details. We're here Monday to Friday, and you're welcome to access us here as well, as we might just be a bit more present um, since we're mostly uh, home-based here. So um, those are our contact details that will be shared later on. Yeah, I'll uh, leave some time for some questions if anyone has them. Um, feel free to throw them in the chat or maybe unmute yourself and um, welcome to, to chime in if anyone has any questions. I know it's a lot of info as well, so. <laughs> And I'm sure that if they do find that they do have questions after the fact, they can reach out to you, right? And yeah, exactly. So yeah, I know information it, overload today. So and um, it might not be something that they actually realize what they need until they're looking for a place and getting to the last stages of uh, securing a accommodation. So yes, absolutely for sure. Um, please reach out anytime. There's never like too many questions. Um, housing is a huge part of your student experience and we want to make sure you're as well informed and educated as possible um so please never hesitate to reach out um especially you know coming to a new country a new city even it's a it's a big change um so hopefully you will, you will connect with us <laughs> perfect well thank you so much jennifer oh, oh sorry, sorry. Have a question <laughs> there's a question i've got a second here from diego um how much do you recommend looking for accommodations on platforms like Kijiji or Airbnb? Um, so Airbnb is for short-term stays. And truthfully, I think there's a whole crackdown going on, Crystal. <laughs> I'm sure you're aware of that. So um, Airbnb, uh, at least it's a valid company, but they usually are for short-term stays. And they're usually quite pricey, um, especially if you know you'll be here for a minimum of four months. I would suggest you find like an actual long-term tenancy with a landlord um, for cost effectiveness. But I don't, like recommend could you do per se like you can definitely check it out but just be really careful of the volume of scams on there um as i mentioned please just be preventative measures like view the rental in person or ask you know for a virtual tour live um and by not sending money then you won't get scammed hopefully that answers your question yeah places for students Fanshawe, western off-campus housing start your search there much more reliable sources Okay, well, perfect. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for joining us. Oh, <laughs> oh sorry. I think it's places for students, a safe platform because it's associated with the college. Um, so no, we can't make any guarantees. Places for Students is actually a third party hired by uh, the college. So they actually run their own website. They have their own customer service and hotline to call. Um, so you can contact them if you have more specific questions. I'm not too familiar with their vetting process. Um, if you have questions about West off-campus housing, I do monitor that. So I can definitely speak for that. But Places for Students, no guarantees. Again, um, it's just a platform where you're more likely to find student-friendly rentals closer to financial campus versus like could you use your Facebook where they're like scattered all across the city um and then sorry last question here do landlords only issuing the RTA agreement need to register they don't need to register with the London institution um so no landlords do not need to register with either school uh, as I mentioned they sh if they have a rental they should be licensed by the city and you can check that in the public database um but they might not be licensed and if you want to enter the tenancy it's still valid it's just that we encourage you to find rentals that are licensed because they've gone through um fire code and like a city inspection to confirm they are suitable for renting um but we do understand that can limit options sometimes when there aren't as many rentals licenses there should be 
Can you replace them on a lease and what are the pros and cons? Um, short answer is generally yes. Um, but I mean, that one's more of a circumstantial question. So perhaps Lucas, if you don't mind reaching out to me personally, I can definitely walk you through that. Um, but just for everyone's knowledge, if you sign a lease, legally binding, if you want to replace yourself, it is possible. Um, but um, sometimes it can be complicated. So ideally, you you understand you're locking yourself into this lease. Um, and what are sublets? So Kat asks, what are sublets? So yes, if you do find sublets online, sublets generally mean um, that, uh, so say, um, Jennifer, it's me here. <laughs> I'm renting a place. And I'm going away for a semester. I'm taking a semester off for four months. So I'm going to sublet my room, meaning I plan to come back after those four months. But I just want someone to move in and pay my rent for me while um, I'm away. So that's what the formal definition of sublet is. Um, sometimes other students misunderstand the word and they plan to leave the lease, but they say they're subletting, even though they plan to leave the lease and you're, you would actually replace them on the lease. So generally, though, um, it, you'd have to ask the person who's subletting to define the terms of that agreement. But if you are subletting, generally, it also means you're not on the lease. So you're not protected by Ontario rental law and you don't have any guarantees to you because you're not um, on the main lease. You're like, if I'm the tenant on the has the lease and you're subletting from me, I become your landlord. So it's just kind of more of like a general lens agreement, as we call it. Um, hopefully I answered the question again. More specifics, or if you want more elaboration, please uh, contact us anytime. But yes, great questions. I think we need to wrap it up for today's session, I think. So yeah, um, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Thanks everyone for coming out. Thank you, Crystal, for having us. And um, I'm sure you'll share our info if people want to reach out. I will. And thank you so much for, for providing so much information that our, our students can really, really benefit from. Yeah, of course. Hopefully it was helpful. Thank you everyone for attending and listening. And hopefully we'll see you all back here on Monday for day six. We are going to be talking to our more care support. So that's your student health plan. Great. Have a good Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Have a great weekend. Take care, everyone. Bye.